Hello and uh, welcome to News Desk, a DW News conversation that takes questions and comments from you and puts them to our experts. And hopefully the answers that we receive from the experts leave us a little bit wiser than when we started. I'm Biresh Banerjee. Hopefully. <laughs> and I'm Michelle Stockman. And I will be paying special attention to your questions, your comments, your takes in the chat. So please put them in there. And we'll then put them to our experts so that you can be a part of the discussion. And uh, today we are looking at the so-called Islamic State Khorasan province, also uh, referred to as ISIS-K, ISKP, there's various abbreviations. And the reason we're talking about so-called Islamic State is, well, because of the attacks last week uh, in Moscow where a concert hall was attacked and uh, Islamic State uh, claimed responsibility mm -hmm. for uh, these uh, attacks. And this, of course, that's not the only part of the story. But there are competing narratives. There are mm -hmm. competing narratives, mm -hmm. as will become clear in the next few minutes. Uh, but, the, but the reason we wanted to talk about Islamic State is because this is not the first time Islamic State has carried out an attack of such a magnitude. And therefore, today, we're really hoping that uh, with these guys who are sending us questions and comments, we can really drill down deeper mm -hmm. into what exactly ISIS-K is, why it is based in Afghanistan, how it is able to carry out attacks half a world away, not just in Moscow, as you will learn, it's in other places as well. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, about the funding of this group. I mean, how well resourced are they? Where do they get their fund from? And towards the latter half of the conversation, we'll take it a step further and try and look at which other countries or regions in the world could be at risk for a Moscow-style terror attack. That's right. Well, to get us started, I'd like to introduce everyone around the table today. Um, so we have Amian Esif. Sorry, Isif. That's right. <laughs> okay, Amian Isif. This, is, this is always a challenge, right? I know. Is it Isif, Isif? I, I practiced before. Okay. <laughs> um, and actually, I know him very well, <laughs> but I always just call him Amian. Uh, he is our colleague in the newsroom. He's also an international correspondent who has just recently reported from Israel and Ukraine. So we're really lucky to have him here today. And he's basically going to kind of spell out for us why we are here talking about this question today. So we'll get to you in a minute. I'll be Amir. doing some live fact checking too. Ah, thank so. you. All right. That's going to be crucial to the story, right? Because of the comments that uh, potentially we've been seeing so far. But yeah, yeah we'll get I've to all that. I've seen some. I've yeah. seen some already. They, sure. they want some fact checks. Okay. And then across from me is Jared Reed. You got it right. Well done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Okay. Michelle, uh, yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> one point, okay. Um, and uh, he's going to be paying also special attention to the chat. You'll see him in there. He's going to help pinpoint some of those comments and questions and also respond to you as he can inside the chat. Yeah. So. And then I think we need to introduce Dustin as well because he's the guy <gasps> who's you. not at the table. That's yeah? right. So Easily forgotten but very important. But I Therefore, remember I his never name. forget him. Yeah, Justin Although Hammerlein. Michelle. You guys probably have seen he just, him on he just lost a point there. It, was, it was one to oh. Michelle, but now it's like okay. minus one to Michelle. Dustin Hammerlein is the guy who yeah. is in the shadows, sitting with our technical guys, talking to us in our earpieces. So when you suddenly see Michelle and me reacting, or for that matter, Amian and uh, Jared reacting to something that's been said in the year, that's Dustin in the year and our year. The guy who makes the show possible. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Dustin, for being there. Uh, and later, just, uh, just to let you guys know, we'll be joined by two experts who will be breaking down what Islamic State is and uh, other aspects to this story. We'll be joined by Colin Clark and Aaron Zellin. I'll tell you more about these guys as we go on. That's right. And of course, I will be looking in the chat at your comments and questions and takes. So again, please put them in there, especially if you want to, first of all, talk about ISK, ISIS-K, and um, the questions you have about the recent attack and how it operates. Um, but, you know, first of all, I just want to say I, I kind of looked in the chat and in the community post before we got started, and there is a lot of a sense there of doubt about the competing narratives that we did talk about, about the claim of responsibility for this attack in Moscow. So we'll be talking about that later. And I just wanted to point out one commenter uh, who kind of, I think, encapsulate this. This is from Only German uh, 960. And he kind of put up kind of an imaginary conversation. Uh, first of all, talking US and EU, they're saying, it's ISIS, believe us. And then Putin comes in and says, no, not this time. And then ISIS responds and says, it's us, please believe us. So again, these competing narratives, and we're going to talk about why that happens in my experience as a journalist after a big shocking event like this. 
it is common among the responses to see doubt, to see even conspiracy theories. Uh, so again, we're going to kind of spell these things out, unfold these threads as we get started. But to kick things off, if you're not already in the chat and have seen this, we've got a poll that we'd like to put to you. And the question we have today that we'd like you to vote on is, how worried are you about an ISIS terror attack where you live? Very worried, slightly worried, not worried at all. And again, this is not a scientific poll, but please, we'd like to know your opinion. So, um, we just like to get the mood of the chat, right? Like what, what people think, what you guys think. Generally, as, as Michelle said, it's not scientific. Uh, but more importantly, we'll have the results uh, towards the latter half of this conversation, which is said to be interesting. Yep. So let's get things started. Amian has been looking at uh, the developments over the past few days since this attack on the Friday mm -hmm. in this uh, concert hall. So just bring us up to speed. Where are we with this attack uh, when it comes to particularly the claim of responsibility, I suppose? Well, on Friday, March 22nd, as you said, four gunmen stormed the Crocus City Hall. That's a, a venue, a concert venue outside of Moscow in Russia. Uh, these gunmen stormed the hall and they began shooting. Uh, there's a lot of videos out there. A lot of people have probably seen that. <clears throat> it seems a lot like the Paris attacks where you have this concert, suddenly shots ring out. Uh, people don't understand what's happening. People are hitting the floor. Um, that's what we saw in those videos. And then the gunmen proceeded to set the concert hall on fire. They had a lot of time to do this. They had anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes, which doesn't sound like a long time, but in situations like this, uh, that gave them free reign to kill a lot of people, and a lot of people died. 139 people have died by the latest counts. Um, so theories began swirling after this footage came out, after the news broke about who was behind this attack. Uh, Putin, Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, his immediate comments suggested that he believed that Ukraine was behind this, but then not much longer after that, ISIS-K, uh, this is a branch of ISIS, claimed responsibility uh, for the terrorist attacks in that concert hall, and in order to prove it, they released a video that appears to have been filmed by the attackers themselves um, showing uh, them celebrating after the attack. So footage that would have been hard to get a hold of if you um, hadn't had something to do with the attack uh, beforehand. Then on Saturday, Russia announced that they had arrested uh, several people in connection with the attack, and then they charged four people um, with terrorism. They claim that these were the men that were in the concert hall, and independent investigations have suggested by looking at the men who appear in these videos and then looking at the men who appear in Russian court, quite beat up, you have to say, but still recognizable, that they are the same men. So that's the evidence that we have that Russia indeed found the attackers. Uh, again, Russia tried to link it to Ukraine by saying that they were found on their way to the Ukrainian border, uh, but that uh, is also in dispute. You'd have to believe Russian intelligence on that, and they have obviously a very good reason to want to link Russia, uh, to link Ukraine to this attack. Um, so what is ISIS-K? And that's what we're going to be talking a lot about uh -huh. today on the show. We're going to have a lot of questions. We're going to put those to the experts. What we know so far is that they are a franchise, basically, of the ISIS organization. They have some autonomy, but they still get um, a lot of their, uh, their support from ISIS. They have the same goals. They want to set up uh, an Islamic caliphate, um, and they want to do this in Khorasan, which if you don't know what Khorasan is, I don't blame you. Um, I have a map here that shows what it is. It's actually um, a province, a historical province that now covers areas of modern states such as Iran, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and all of Afghanistan. So the organization is basically, the franchise is based in Afghanistan, taking advantage of that kind of security vacuum that was left after the US pulled out of Afghanistan in 2021 um, and left the Taliban in charge. Uh, what's important to note is the Taliban and ISIS-K do not get along. Uh, one time you may have heard of ISIS-K before you knew who they were was in August 2021 when the U.S. was withdrawing. Hundreds of people were at the airport in Kabul and right. ISIS-K attacked, killing yeah. um, uh, over 100, 182 people. Very deadly terrorist attack, mm -hmm. uh, very shocking, and that was claimed by ISIS-K um, in order to humiliate the Taliban, actually. Yeah as well as attacking American uh, soldiers. Um, and more recently, you may have heard of the bombing in Iran at the memorial for um, Soleimani, the um, uh, deceased general in Iran, and there about 94 people were killed. So they may not be on everybody's radar, but they have claimed a lot of lives yeah. in recent years, and so we're gonna be digging into that. 
Uh, just, just to take sure. one step back to that, uh, the, the, the <clears throat> Russian narrative that was, uh, I think it was President Putin who first mentioned it, that these attackers were potentially heading towards Ukraine. I mean, mm -hmm. the Ukrainian president himself hit back and said, well, this is just absolutely absurd. And then it was followed up by Ukrainian intelligence saying that this is not the case, that these attackers were not really headed mm -hmm. towards Ukraine, just to mention over there. Yeah, definitely. And I think... Um Thank you, Amian, for that. And just to go off of that, just um, one of the users that we've got here, <clears throat> going off of what you just said, Baresh, um, at Madara8533 says, ask why Russia ignored the U.S. warning and responded so slowly when the attack happened. Mm -hmm. uh, Russian police just let it happen. So, you know, there, the U.S. intelligence agencies did, again, report or say that they had warned Russia ahead of this, and that might be part of what's propelling Putin with his narrative. Um, uh if yeah, I just made one more thing about competing narratives, I can totally understand why people are confused because I was too, right when the news broke, we're living in a world, we were talking about this when we were coming up with the show, we, we live in a world of big power politics now, which doesn't reflect the world that uh, ISIS came of age in. And so, you know, as soon as you hear news about Moscow, you immediately think of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you think of the big wars that are happening that are consuming the news right now, mm -hmm. and you want to place everything into that, yeah. what we understand as the big issues now, but ISIS-K, ISIS in general, lives in a completely different world from people who consume Western yeah. media, and I would say for most of the world, actually, because they really don't believe in states, they believe that the caliphate is coming, yeah. um, they don't care who wins in Ukraine, they don't even align themselves as the Palestinians in any serious way. Mm. Um, they're really a world apart. And so I think that we need to keep that in mind when we talk today about like um, all the swirling narratives because it might seem strange that ISIS-K attacks Moscow, but yeah. ISIS-K is, is strange to Westerners, I think. Yeah, and I think this is where we can uh, bring in our two guests, our two experts. De definitely, and just before yeah. we do, there's a couple of questions I think we should ask them. Um, Alanomi has said, I have questions, many, many questions. Yes, we're going to put those to our experts. But again, what Madara8533 said, why Russia ignored the U.S. warning. And then um, we also have a question, why did the gunmen allow themselves to be captured? Isn't the usual MO of jihadists to um, self-delete? so-called, uh, after the attack. So this might be something to... Uh, no, I'm sure, to I'm sure this is what our experts can also look at. And also just to point out, uh, just to sort of call out uh, David Cirello, who also was also asking, why did they attack Russian civilians? Right. Mm -hmm. Many questions. Let's bring our experts in, finally, uh, who have been waiting patiently. Colin Clark and Aaron Zellin are both joining us uh, from the United States. Colin Clark... On the left of your screens now is Director of Research at the Sufan Group. It's an intelligence and security consultancy. And uh, joining, he's joining us from Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania and from Washington, D.C. We have Aaron Zellin. That's Aaron on the right of your screen. He's a senior fellow with the Washington Institute for Near East uh, Policy. Uh, and uh, Aaron he also is the founder of uh, jihadology.net. I hope I'm getting that right, Aaron. That is also that is an academic website that looks at jihadist activity around the world, particularly Islamic State. Welcome, gentlemen. Both these men, Colin and Aaron, are really... Many of them, both of them have also written the book literally on Islamic State. They've been following Islamic State over the years and we look forward to hearing what they both have to say. Colin, if, if I can just start with you, just, just talking about uh, Islamic State and, uh, and Russia, uh, as we, we are seeing in our, in our chat as well from the guys who are watching us, uh, the question about why... ISIS attacked uh, Moscow, and I know it has been said in the past few days that, look, there was Russian involvement in Afghanistan in the 80s, then you had the Chechen wars in the 90s, and you had uh, support for Bashar al-Assad in Syria. But my question based off of that is that these things happened some time back. Why did ISIS-K have to attack Russia now? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, jihadis have long memories, right? Uh, they're talking about things that happened literally hundreds of years ago in their propaganda. So uh, actually, those things are fairly recent if you if you look at the historical sweep uh -huh. uh, with which many uh -huh. of these people uh, look at the world. Uh, I would say, you know, the Russians also continue to support Bashar al-Assad and prop him up. And if you look at the pecking order of uh, within ISIS propaganda of who the Islamic State hates, Shia are right at the very top. Uh, Russia is now perceived in some ways as a vanguard of Shia Islam, working closely with the Iranians, who themselves were hit by ISKP uh, in early January, propping up Bashar al-Assad 
And then with the Wagner Group, Russian mercenaries working uh, on the ground in Syria with the likes of Lebanese Hezbollah. So Putin is viewed as a as a stooge propping up, uh, you know, countries that are Shia uh, dictators and uh, terrorist groups on the ground. So right then and there. But you know, I had a piece in Foreign Policy last year. It was titled "The Islamic State's New Target: Russia." This isn't new to folks that have been following this. I think that answered a question from Demi Geek. What's the relationship between ISIS K and Iran? So there you go, Demi Geek. Uh, let's just bring in um, Aaron over here. Uh, Aaron, you listen to what uh, Colin was saying there. I mean, is there also um, an angle here of uh, uh, Muslims taking a revenge for acts committed by? Christian nations, I mean, is that, am I, am, am I going too far out on a limb here by asking you this question? Is there that angle as well? Yes, there's uh, definitely that angle. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Colin was talking a bit more about the geopolitical angle, which is very relevant. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also important to bring in the ideological angle as well, where while a lot of the time many people focus on sort of how the Islamic State, as well as in the past Al-Qaeda, has been anti-Western, um, but from the perspective of these jihadis, uh, Russia is considered crusaders as well, just Eastern crusaders. Um, and therefore, um, because Russia has backed Iran, the Assad regime in Syria, as well as forming relations with the Taliban in Afghanistan after the U.S. left, which... ISKP views as an enemy. And then we also see more recently Russia's Wagner Group and now its reformulated African Corps has been backing these coup regimes in the Sahel region in, in sub Saharan Africa and Mali, uh, Burkina Faso, and Niger now. Um, and, and they're actually you know, going against uh, the Islamic State as well as Al Qaeda's local branch. And therefore, um, you know, there's, there's definitely uh, an angle, both ideological from their perspective as well as a geopolitical perspective. And we're talking about ISIS-K here. I mean, I know that you insist on calling it ISKP. That's one of the other abbreviations that are, are doing the round. But just for the purposes of this discussion, let's just call him ISIS-K. Uh, talk to us about ISIS-K in particular in relation to Moscow. Is ISIS-K now the vanguard of Islamic State? Or is this uh, uh, an autonomous... Uh, franchise of, I, of ISIS or so-called Islamic State that is now taking the fight to the Russians. Yeah, how, how much do they really yeah, like, relate or is it a center of gravity and... Because we were just debating this yeah. before the show, like ISIS versus ISIS-K, is there a difference? Is one the franchise of the other? I mean, what's the connection there and why is it ISIS-K that's attacking uh, 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 Moscow? I mean, Sorry, if you question? look at the way that... You no. want to go, Colin? Now, go ahead. Go ahead, Colin. No, well, well I, I will go back to, uh, I think, just, you know, the name itself. Uh, you know, we have both used ISKP. You guys have called them ISK. A lot of newspapers do, too. This is maybe Aaron's personal jihad, uh, as he reminded <laughs> us on Twitter this morning. And he's he's 100% right. But we, for the sake of the interview, we, we can say ISIS-K. Um, you know, I think <clears throat> this is a global network, right, of affiliates. Um, there's various levels of command and control between the different affiliates and the core. The core has been under significant pressure in Iraq and Syria. And uh, as a result, we've seen an outgrowth in other parts of the world. Aaron mentioned the Sahel before. Uh, we've got numerous IS affiliates active in that part of the world. Very high civilian uh, death toll. Same thing with South Asia. Uh, but it's also important to recognize that these aren't static, right? These uh, provinces ebb and flow in strength. Uh, and in response to geopolitical circumstances, they're very right. opportunistic. You'd asked before, why now? Why attack Russia now? I think, look, the Russians are, appear to be vulnerable. Uh, they've been in Ukraine for two plus years. Things aren't going well. Uh, and the Russian security services, look how long it took them to respond to this attack. They're busy persecuting Alexei Navalny supporters and probably roughing up people that you know, the 5% of Russians that maybe didn't vote for Putin in the sham election. They should be focused on counterterrorism, not persecuting everyday Russians. But Colin, can I just go off of this? Jay Erickson asked that question, why Russia, why now? Um, why aren't they concerned about retaliation? But another way of looking at this is, what is the win for ISIS-K out of this attack? What is, what's the benefit to them? What are they getting? Every single newspaper across the world is carrying a picture of that theater on fire. And everyone's talking about this for days on end. So that publicity, you can't pay for, right? This is a terrorist group 
that is now the topic of conversation from the White House to Westminster uh, and beyond, right? And so, number one, that brings a lot of attention on the group. That's going to bring in probably some money for the group. It's going to help them recruit, and it's going to help do what terrorists seek to do, which is terrorize. We can't forget the psychological element of all this. Uh, to you, Aaron, I mean, is this something that is really going to boost ISS, uh, ISIS-K numbers? Because as, as uh, from the literature that I was reading and the research that is available, ISIS-K numbers in Afghanistan uh, have decreased, in fact, uh, over the, in, in recent years. Yeah, we've seen that the Taliban has, um, you know, fought against uh, the Islamic State in Afghanistan and degraded a lot of their capabilities in recent years. And um, while there are still attacks in Afghanistan now uh, against civilians, against the Taliban, against uh, local Shia minority, um, as well as um, against uh, different diplomatic infrastructure like the Chinese, the Russians and the Iranians, um, locally, it's, it's not as much of an acute threat. And therefore, I think it's important to distinguish between sort of its local operations versus external operations, where uh, there's this paradox that while the uh, local operations have gone down, there's actually been an increase in its external operations in, in the last year or so. So, um, you know, from like 2018 through 2022, you really only saw three external operations from ISKP, whereas, you know, uh, in, in uh, 2022 to 2023, we saw about eight. And mm -hmm. now in the last 12 months, there, after this attack in Russia, we've had 22 external operations, either plots that were broken up ahead of time or successful attacks like the one we saw in Russia and, and you know, like ones in Iran and Turkey earlier this year as well. Um, uh, and, and part of this is that these types of attacks provide the space then for, you know, <clears throat> the Islamic State in general and, and the Khurasan province to, uh, you know, uh, recruit more people to potentially do attacks because it's showing that they are successful. They're not only been able to do this in Russia, but it's sort of a, a momentum issue where they had this large scale one in Iran at the beginning of the year. And then a few weeks later, we saw this sort of smaller scale one in, in Turkey. But um these these help build uh, sort of the momentum of the group in the same way that we saw about you know a decade ago from around 2014 to 2017 where there was all, all these subsequent attacks we saw from uh, the Islamic State in uh, different parts of Europe whether it was you know France Belgium UK mm -hmm. Germany etc. You know let's, let's throw up a map I think mm -hmm. I mean you have a map and this is a here. map that should be familiar to you Aaron <laughs> because. Well, you created it, and uh, it's a map that maybe Amian can introduce, and uh, Aaron, maybe you can uh, sort of guide uh, uh, guide uh, everybody who's watching this chat and uh, this live stream on. Right, so it's from the Washington Institute. Um, it's called the Islamic State Select Worldwide Activity, um, and you can see the activity of the Islamic State. I mean, you can explain this better, Aaron, um, <clears throat> but it's basically a database. Not every bubble is an attack. Um, if you zoom in, though, you can see uh, the little red dots are the are attacks, and then you have other information on here. Capture of people, you also have like uh, people who are designated, um, state designates uh, somebody a, a terrorist. Uh, what I found pretty interesting and relevant to what we were just <coughs> talking about when we we're talking about the rise and fall and rise again of ISIS, um, you can see here, this is what I think is the coolest part about this map, is you can see all of the information, I'll mark it here for you guys, all of the information you can see how dense it is from 2015 to 2019. And I'm working down here in the corner here uh, under the timeline. And then you kind of, it seems to dissipate a little bit here between 2018 and 2022. And then you see all this activity up until the most recent data. So I think that's one way to visualize how uh, the attacks have really increased um, in the past maybe, two or three years. Maybe Aaron can come in. Aaron, I'm assuming you can see this map that uh, Amian has up. I mean, this is the map that yes. you created. Can you can you help us understand uh, exactly what Amian just said as to why this increasing tendency uh, of attacks between, it's a little far away from me, for between 2019 and 2023. Is that correct, Amian? I'm not being able to see this quite clearly. Yeah, I mean, generally well, between like 2018 and 2022, you can see that there's a less dense um, data about activity from ISIS. Right. Go ahead, Aaron, please. I think part of it is that if, if uh, uh, the viewers will recall that in, um, you know, from 2017 to 2019 was when you really saw the collapse of IS's territorial control in Iraq and Syria. Um, and therefore, they were then trying to 
rebuild itself, not only locally in terms of uh, insurgency and terrorism campaign, but they've also sort of diversified their activities. And we've saw a, seen a huge growth of activity, especially in sub-Saharan Africa in subsequent years. And this has really grown, you know, whether it's in Nigeria, whether it's in the Sahel region, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. And we've also seen a growth in Mozambique, too, in, in recent years. Um, and therefore, put all together, um, while the center of gravity in terms of the senior leadership of the group remains in sort of the Iraq, Syria, and likely uh, Turkey, uh, mm -hmm. you have sort of these other quote-unquote provinces, um, which I think is important to, to note is that um, while we talk about IS in Iraq and Syria, they actually specifically call them the Al Sham and Al Iraq province, meaning the Syria and the Iraq province. So while we just say usually Iraq and Syria, they describe them as provinces as well. Um, so when right. we talk about the Khorasan province or the Sahel province, it's part of this broader system. So there isn't a difference per se. It's it's all under the broader senior leadership of uh, IS. I just I mean, wanted to jump in. Sorry, I just uh, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to say that I put the map, uh, the link to that map that we've yeah. been talking about in the comments. So if you want to interact with it, it's there. Please do have a look at it. And, and, it's amazing. And, and yeah. just to let you know that uh, this is this amazing map that uh, Aaron has created. Thanks so much for for that public service, Aaron. Because yeah. this map we're going to come back to in the in the conversation uh, as 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 we progress. This is not the final time that we bring this map up. But just to go back to you, Colin, to a point that you mentioned. Uh, earlier uh, as to what these kind of attacks in Moscow do for ISIS. It also helps them uh, generate funds and generate money and finances for the group. And I did want to talk to you about finances because before we began this live stream, there were lots of people who were questioning where ISIS gets its money from, essentially. So can you just give us a brief intro or some sort of a clue as to how an organization based in uh, Afghanistan that, as Aaron also pointed out, is having to face the brunt of attacks from Taliban, is able to conduct operations beyond Afghanistan. Where is it getting the money to do it from? Yeah, for, first let me start by also uh, acknowledging Aaron's map because as a researcher, a uh, longtime colleague and friend of his, uh, it's tremendous and he deserves uh, a lot of credit for it. Uh, in terms of finances, actually, I'd, I'd point you to Twitter to today to Jessica Davis, who is uh, a, a terrorism financing expert, and did a little thread about the current Moscow attack and how that may have been funded. We're still going to await details on that, but she's got a couple of hypotheses that are interesting. Writ large, when we look at the group in Afghanistan, it pulls funds from a number, number of different arenas, not too dissimilar from Islamic State provinces and other parts of the world. You've got kidnapping for ransom. You've got extortion, you've got taxation, so kind of mafia-style activities. They also make money in the informal economy through timber smuggling uh, and other means in the areas where this group operates. So, uh, you know, factor all of those issues in, right? Afghanistan, the Taliban government still not recognized by the international community. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of opportunity to operate in the informal economy. Uh, you know, something I have personal experience in, I, I served on a uh, counter-corruption task force in Afghanistan back in 2011. So looking at all the ways that terrorists and insurgents made money from criminal means, um, obviously a Taliban's largely involved with uh, narcotics. Uh, but when you look at the attack itself, not not too expensive, not incredibly expensive to uh, to purchase some firearms, to get some incendiary devices. Again, small dollar terrorism can be effective. Uh, you know, if you look at th th this attack, th they could put this together for, you know, I'd say a couple of thousand dollars. Yeah, I mean, this is something that people are talking about in the chat. PJG said who paid those guys is what we have to ask, which we did. Um, they want to know um, where ISIS gets its money from. But I think also when we're talking about this attack in Moscow, uh, the win, so-called, for ISIS K was um, publicity and potentially recruitment. And there is some confusion um, about, we've, we have a comment from Nun Nun, um, are ISIS and Taliban the same maybe groups? So, I mean, we've, we've talked, we know that the Taliban and ISIS K are fighting, but when we talk about like the guys who are actually in these groups, how are they recruited and how might they, you know, be moving between, say, uh, different militant factions. How does that? How have you seen that play out? And let's let's put that to Aaron. 
So in terms of the dynamic between the two groups, uh, both the Taliban and ISIS in Afghanistan view each other as enemies. Um, you know, since uh, IS in Afghanistan has been operating more or less since around, you know, late 2014, early 2015, they've been attacking the Taliban, um, as well as the Taliban's various allies in the region, um, including um, the Taliban in Pakistan, for that matter. Um, uh, Likewise, since the Taliban uh, has taken power over the last couple of years, they've done a lot of, uh, you know, counter insurgent as well as quote unquote counter terrorism operations against IS. So, you know, uh, not only from an ideological perspective do they view each other as enemies, but in terms of what's actually happening on the ground, they keep on battling one another since they have a different vision for things because the Taliban is more of you know, uh, while, you know, Islam is an important frame for them, uh, they focus mainly on Afghanistan and, and uh, their nation, whereas from the Islamic State's perspective, whether it is in Afghanistan or elsewhere, you know, they're looking at this from a transnational perspective where, you know, like we've been saying, the Khorasan province is just one province within this broader organizational structure, which they would view as a caliphate and therefore this alternative, uh, you know, government that goes outside of the frame of how we view the international system, since they view it as something that should be running the entire world. Uh, maybe uh, just like uh, bringing Ami in here. I mean, I don't know how you feel about maybe doing a bit of research on, uh, I don't know, if there's any data on the number of Taliban uh, operations against uh, ISIS K mm -hmm. in Afghanistan, or uh, the, the 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 decreasing number of members of ISIS K over a certain period? I mean, just to sort of yeah. get an idea of uh, what is happening on the ground in Afghanistan between Taliban. Sure. And, and while the camera's on me, I, if you can show my screen, uh, just relevant to what we're talking about, the Taliban and um, ISIS-K, this came out right after the Moscow attack. It was the Afghan Taliban released a statement on the attack and said that we condemn in the strongest terms the recent terrorist attack in Moscow and consider it a blatant violation of all human standards. So speaking a very different language from ISIS there and directly condemning uh, that terrorist attack. And one can, can see the linkages, right? Because that's uh, something that Colin and Aaron were both talking about. Russia and mm -hmm. China have courted the Taliban. And in fact, uh, uh, the Taliban leaders did uh, end up in Moscow a mm -hmm. number of times ahead of the takeover in Afghanistan. What's interesting, too, is that it doesn't seem like they're just distancing themselves from this attack, but distancing some, themselves from all terrorism exactly. because they're citing human standards and human rights. Um, which is a very different tone. Seeking recognition as a government, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. no one's recognized them. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Colin, can I just uh, uh, come back uh, to a point that you were making about uh, the financing and uh, how it takes just, uh, what was it, a couple of thousand dollars, you had said, I think, to put up this kind of a Moscow-style attack? Uh, uh, I mean, on a, on a low end, if you're just talking about what it costs to procure the rifles and potentially the explosives, mm -hmm. right? Uh, these guys had GoPro cameras. You know, how much does... Uh, a couple of rifles cost. Right. Uh, now, obviously, right. there's planning that goes into this. Uh, there's other elements, so that, that number could go up. But if you decided to do it bare bones, uh, you could pull it off. I, I just want to say one thing briefly about the last comment. I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the absurdity that the Taliban are talking about human rights standards. We yeah. shouldn't let them slide with that one. Uh, this is a group that's violated more human rights than uh, most other entities on planet Earth. So, uh, you know, ISIS-K is horrible, but the Taliban is not much better. Right. And, and to go back to the, the, the feud between the ISIS-K and the Taliban, you mentioned, Colin, that when it came to funding, ISIS-K was looking at things like kidnapping, taxation, timber smuggling. Given that they are engaged in, what do we call it, a feud, a clash, a war with the Taliban in Afghanistan, how, how are they being able to make money off of these illegal activities when the Taliban is cracking down so hard on ISIS-K? Well, the Taliban doesn't control the entire country. Uh, you know, they're stretched thin. They were really effective insurgents. They're not really effective counterinsurgents. Sure, they're pinning down ISIS-K uh, and they're limiting domestic attacks. But the fact that Afghanistan is still a springboard for external operations shows you that this group, look, the U.S. military was in the country for 20 plus years and wasn't able to defeat transnational terrorist groups. The Taliban's not going to be able to do it. They are more powerful than ISIS-K. They're not powerful enough to totally attenuate the group. Is there any way to sort of uh, halt this flow of funds? You know, uh, killing and capturing ISIS-K, which is, again, uh, going to prove to be a challenge. 
th th this is a country that's still not formally integrated into the international system. Mm -hmm. uh, and so by default, you're, you're left to operate in the informal economy. Uh, the Taliban does it as well. Uh, uh, can I come back to you, Aaron, because you were talking about uh, the, the provinces that uh, Islamic State views around the world. And I just wondered if uh, you could uh, shed some light on uh, uh, how the Islamic State views the world. And maybe we can bring up that map that you have created in the Washington Institute to show the breadth of ISIS operations across the world. Uh, and because that map also has this, uh, this drop-down list on provinces on the top uh, right, I think it is. Talk us through, Aaron, how the Islamic State views the world? I mean, what do they view as their caliphate? What do they view as Muslim lands? What do they view as their claim? I mean, from their perspective, they view anybody that doesn't pledge allegiance to its leader, now Abu Hudayfa, um, uh, that they are against the group either as um, infidels, if they're you know not Muslim, or apostates for people that they view as pretending to be Muslims or uh, not truly living up to what you know their interpretation of Islam is. Um, you know, their ultimate goal is not only to control territory that has been historically um, within the Muslim world, but obviously outside of that too. I mean, they they view the go global caliphate everywhere on Earth. Um, even including a place like Antarctica is, is, is should be under God's law. Um, so obviously it's extremely maximalistic and um, utopian in some ways to think that that's even possible, especially since they view everybody more or less as an enemy that disagrees with them. Um, and yet here we are now, um, you know, 10 years since they really declared that openly um, and they're, you know, operating in more spaces than they had uh, you know, when they're originally just in Iraq and then in Syria. Go ahead. No, go ahead. You go ahead. You know, I just, I just wanted to sort of <laughs> address the absurdity of it, and I just wondered what Islamic State thinks. I mean, you're basically making the entire world an enemy. Everybody in the world is an infidel. They cannot possibly believe that, I don't know, all countries can be defeated uh, at, at any point in time. I mean, like, what is the goal here, Aaron? I mean, do they really want to take on every country one by one and carry out terror attacks there? Is that really the plan? I think part of it is that they view what happened at the beginning of Islam as a model where, you know, uh, when Muhammad and his followers were able to take down the Persian Empire and the Byzantine Empire in quick order. Obviously, the world is much different now. The context is totally different. Um, the international system is totally different in the way that you know, everything operates is different. Um, but I think from their perspective, that's how they view this uh, playing out. And, you know, even if you look at more recent history, while, um, you know, uh, neither, you know, uh, ISIS or Al Qaeda, for that matter, really had any role in it, they view that, you know, the Soviet Union's loss in Afghanistan and the unraveling of the Soviet Union afterwards um, is, is another precedent of a so-called quote unquote empire falling as well. So while it seems absurd, um, and I, I agree it's it's a bit fanciful in some ways, um, they still believe that if they keep on, you know, doing this, a death by a thousand cuts will eventually undermine not only local regimes, but um, global entities as well. Colin, you wanted to come in on this? Uh, Willie Yacht Antarctica. You heard it from Aaron first, so if that uh, comes to fruition, he gets credit there. No, I, I largely agree with him. It's an expansionist group, right, that has over time sought to conquer new territories. Uh, it's spread out. And I think, you know, we're, in the aftermath of, of this attack, everyone wants to know if these people were card-carrying um, ISIS-K members, right? And they think of these things in such clean and neat categories, but you have to recognize that you know, there are these networks that exist out there. There are kind of free agents, right? Go back to a guy like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, you know, one of the principal people involved in the 9-11 attacks. He was never actually a sworn member of Al-Qaeda. He was a jihadi entrepreneur, uh, as my friend Asaf Magadam called him. Uh, you know, there are these people out there. There, there, there are these networks. Uh, the structure of jihadi groups are much different even than they were 20 or 30 years ago mm -hmm. because of globalization, mm -hmm. because of advances in technology and communications uh, and banking, right? And so uh, they don't need to be this kind of top-down hierarchical organizational structure. Even if it looks like that on paper, it's much more complicated, as Aaron alluded to, when it comes to operations on the ground.
can can we talk a bit more about those operations on the ground, though? Um, there is a. a comment here in the chat from Lilia Yusupova, and we want to talk about the suspects, actually. Um, she says, or sorry, he, she, they, say there are, uh, there's enough proof, um, or is there enough proof that those arrested port Tajiks are to blame? Now, that leads me to the question, um, Aaron, if we look at that map, you know, Tajikistan is inside Khorasan, and when we talk about members of ISIS-K, Obviously, there is an ideological attraction to it, but is the picture more complicated? Can we talk about what's going on in Tajikistan um, that might be another factor, say, economic factors that might lead people to find ISIS-K ideology more attractive than what they're getting in their other, from their government there? Well, I mean, uh, you know, local contexts are just as important. I mean, the thing is, is that all of this is not, you know, one answer. Um, there's various answers to this. There are personal grievances, and then you have the ideological aspect of it, and then combined together, you kind of get somebody that not only has a motivation, but then is mobilized by a particular ideology and, and then connecting to the network to potentially do something. I'd also note that um, while it, it's plausible that, you know, there could have been something within Tajikistan that's relevant to this, there's also a, a large um, migrant community of Tajiks as well as Central Asians that live in Moscow. Mm -hmm. So in the same way we've seen individuals in Western Europe that are from the Arab world and then have gotten involved in jihadi networks and done attacks there, we should view it in the same light where somebody might not have had the best, you know, situation in Moscow because they're seen as a minority. Um, you know, there might have been a tragedy in their life. Then they link up to something in IS ideology that provides them relevance or significance in their life. Come together, they want to do something to go against this. And, you know, Russia is seen as the big bad guy in this story then. Um, and then they're able to, you know, attempt this particular attack. And, you know, we've seen obviously other cases of this in other countries and contexts as well. But mm -hmm. it's 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 a similar dynamic in, in some respects. And when you put it, all these ingredients together, it kind of leads to an attack like this. Yeah, I, I, I want to come to Colin, but okay. uh, but before that, just for just for uh, the people who are just joining us on the live stream and wondering what is going on, just a quick recap, and then we can proceed. Uh, what we're discussing right now is, as you might have heard, is ISIS-K, so-called Islamic State, Khorasan Province, or ISKP, ISKP, I'm sorry, mixing up my German here, uh, that claimed the attack on the on the uh, Moscow Concert Hall last week, at least 139 people are dead. And what we're trying to do on the DW News Desk, this conversation, is trying to understand ISIS-K better as to what motivates them, how they're able to carry out these attacks further afield beyond the borders of Afghanistan. Colin and Aaron are with us and trying to help us answer those questions. Did you have a question? I, I, no, I just wanted to add that um, some Tajiks had been recruited to fight for Russia in Syria. So um, that's also something that they were involved in and might have colored uh, their opinions um, about their life and, and which ideology might be attractive. And also um, the latest figures from 2019 said 30% of um, Tajikistan's economy is immigrant rem remittances or migrant labor remittances. So yeah, there's um, definitely a large uh, population that's going out and, uh, into the world to, to send money back. So just wanted to yeah. expand it beyond Tajikistan as well. And this goes back to what we were discussing, Amyan, before we began this live stream about <clears throat> the entire breadth of attacks mm. or attacks that have been foiled. Uh, across the world. And Colin, this is for you, because uh, based on the, the meager research that I did before this program, because, before this uh, conversation, because I always do meager research, uh, is that uh, attacks, for example, uh, have been reported for, uh, claimed by ISIS-K in Pakistan, Iran, Afghanistan, Russia, but there have also been attacks that have been foiled in Germany, Turkey, and Tajikistan. So uh, I'm just trying to understand, I guess, uh, Colin, how is it that uh, ISIS-K is able to do its recruitment to enable attacks planned in such diverse geographies? Yeah, well, I think it gets to the point that I just made, which is we don't have to think of people as card-carrying members of an organization. Uh, there are these extremist networks that exist in parts of Central Asia, the Caucasus and elsewhere, that clearly the Islamic State Khorasan has tapped into, right? Uh, you know, whether it's 
uh, the Tajik diaspora or a diaspora of uh, of another country, right? We live in a global world. Uh, and I think, you know, if you look at the kind of flow of foreign fighters, go back to uh, the apex of the Islamic State, 2014, 15, 16, where you had tens of thousands of foreign fighters from dozens of countries flocking to fight for, you know, a bloodthirsty regime. The first question was, wow, what would attract so many people to such a horrible organization, right? And there's a million explanations, and Aaron, Aaron alluded to that, right? There's personal grievances. There's socioeconomic grievances. Some people were looking to get married. Some people were true sociopaths. There's so many different variables and factors that go into the radicalization process or what motivates somebody. I think at this point, just uh, stay with us, Aaron and Colin, because uh, maybe I can bring uh, Jared in uh, to the conversation just to get uh, a feel for what uh, you guys are posting uh, in the chat and the, and the kinds of comments and questions we are getting. So just a quick summary of uh, what the mood is, I suppose. Yeah, I guess we've been talking about a battle of ideologies, uh, <laughs> and that's definitely playing out in the chat and, and, and in a topic like this, which you might kind of expect. I, I kind of wanted to bring in a question that two people have posed, and I, that's why I'm bringing it in, um, talking about, I guess, how an attack is carried out and, and what the attackers actually do. Um, two people have asked, why did the gunmen allow themselves to be captured? Isn't it the usual modus operandi of jihadists to, I don't know, kill themselves, blow themselves up? Why did they allow themselves to be caught, which is not such a, such a common thing? Maybe that's something our, our guests could have a stab at answering. I, I don't know. Should I just, should we just come to you, Aaron, first? And if, uh, Colin, you have something to add to that, just feel free to speak after Aaron. Is that, is that all right? Sure. So, Aaron. So, I mean, I think, yeah, I think it's a bit of a misnomer. While it is true in the past, we have seen individuals do attacks and at the end of them before they're captured, they potentially blow themselves up. But we've also seen cases where, you know, they try and extend the attack even longer and, and, and further. So it's, it's plausible that they had a second stage of the attack where they're gonna do something else. Um, and it's, it's likely that they had these getaway cars to sort of replenish themselves and then possibly do something else in the future. Um, uh, in the same way we saw, you know, um, uh, you know, it, it took some time, for example, you know, the famous Paris attacks, you know, some of the guys took a few days to find. Um, and part of that is that they're trying to do something again. Um, we saw this in the, the attack in Barcelona as well. I think it was in 2017. Um, so it's, it's not like this uh, full foolproof thing where, um, you know, they just are trying to die right away in an attack. And um, can I just yeah, follow? I, 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 oh, sorry, I just wanted to add really, really ahead, quickly. Colin. Yeah, I mean, and Aaron's right, and the, and the Bataclan is instructive here, right? Uh, Salah Abdeslam was actually on the lam for, I think, weeks, if not longer, um, until he was located in Molenbeek, not too far from where he grew up. Uh, but I would also say in terms of why these individuals and the phrasing maybe has thrown me off, allow themselves to be caught. I don't, I don't think they allowed themselves to be caught. I think, you know, the Russian authorities tracked them down and they just didn't happen to have suicide explosives. One of the reasons for that could be related to their OPSEC, their operational security, that they may have thought it too risky to seek to procure the materials to put together a sophisticated suicide vest and thought it actually better. That could have, you know, tipped off the plot before it came to fruition. So uh, there, there's a number of reasons. Uh, you know, I'm not particularly optimistic that the Russians are going to be transparent and forthcoming about the details. Mm -hmm. So we'll likely be have to speculate on a lot of these, uh, but we'll see what uh, comes out in the coming days. And Colin, can I follow on that? Um, we've been called out in the chat by nameless person, Dash, uh, saying, is anyone else noticing the hosts are only picking questions that don't scrutinize the official narrative? So is there reason to doubt ISIS-K's claim that they're responsible for this attack? You know, I, I mean, as conspiracy theorist 73 asks, no, I don't think we need to get into, you know, uh, doing the Kremlin's job for them and kind of going down these rabbit holes that are purely absurd and have zero evidence to support them. Well, I would phrase it this way then, because ISIS has claimed responsibility for attacks where there wasn't clear evidence that they were behind it, no? So you're saying that this, this is a case where there is clear evidence. 
I mean, look, U.S. intelligence warned the Russians about this a week before it happened. Uh, the Islamic State has claimed it. The individuals look at some of Arik Toller's work in the New York Times. Uh, you know, this is a case of Occam's razor. <clears throat> the simplest explanation is typically the right one. We don't have to invent all of these reasons, right, and play into Vladimir Putin's hands. They're pushing out disinformation left and right. Partly, the Russians are embarrassed that they missed this. Mm -hmm. Even with the heads up, they still weren't able to prevent it. So, you know, that's a lot of what you're seeing, I think, is some self-loathing on the part of the, the Russian security services, because, you know, their civilians, their citizens died, and they should have prevented this. Just, just, to, just to stay on this point, and, and forgive me if I'm belaboring it, but it's a very important point that uh, Amian raised. And, and this is to you, Aaron, because the map that you have created that is so interactive and so helpful, uh, it, I, th I think it has a drop-down menu there that talks about IS claimed attacks. Have there been instances in the past, Aaron, in which IS has claimed an attack but hasn't really been responsible for it? I can only think one out of tens of thousands of attacks that they've mm -hmm. claimed where there's been suspicion that they weren't involved. Mm -hmm. And it's the attack in Las Vegas in the United States a few years ago. But every single other attack we've seen from them, mm -hmm. there's full, you know, like 100% proof that they're involved. Um, but besides that, um, you know, so just because one thing happened doesn't mean every single thing else discredits um, what they're doing. Right. Fair enough. Let's just let's just stay with the map and maybe we can uh, have a zoomed out version of the map because I'd like to take this a little forward and uh, try and look forward as to which <coughs> other uh, which other countries and regions could potentially be at risk of a Moscow-style attack, or maybe nothing as major as that, but an ISIS-sponsored uh, attack in the near future, given that here in Europe, for example, you have the Paris Olympics that is coming up in the summer, then you have the uh, Euros that is also coming up in the summer in Germany. Uh, an open question, really, just to get the discussion going on this particular aspect. Maybe to you uh, first, Colin, where would you be looking at which, which country, which region in the world would you be looking at as potentially the next target of a potential ISIS-K attack? Europe, put simply. Uh, if you look at the operational tempo and the frequency of plots targeting Europe, it's clear that ISIS is determined to launch uh, a large-scale <coughs> attack uh, on the continent. And so number of plots trace back to Germany, connections to Austria, the Netherlands, uh, Sweden has become a target and has been uh, referenced in uh, IS propaganda uh, related to the Quran burning. So uh, these guys clearly are determined. They have the intent to go after Europe. You mentioned those targets before. Uh, Paris 2024 Summer Olympics would be at the very top of the list, mm -hmm. uh, right? Again, mm -hmm. think of terms of symbolism, in terms of worldwide attention. They'd love nothing more than to go after uh, a target like that. And at least to my knowledge, when fr uh, French President Emmanuel Macron referenced the other day that ISK yeah. plots had been disrupted on French soil, that's the first I remember of hearing of that, uh, you know, in, in France. And so uh, a lot going on. If you look at the Discord leaks, you can kind of get a sense of the uh, the spike in attacks. And Aaron mentioned the number before, just in the past few years, I think 22, uh, 22 plots uh, is the number that he mentioned. But, you know, a real spike in um, attempts and plots. And that yeah. shows you the groups. And when intents married with capability, you have a deadly combination. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned uh, President Emmanuel Macron. I'm glad you did. Colin, because I did uh, uh, want us to sort of want our, uh, uh, anybody who's looking at the live stream to sort of listen to what President Macron said just a couple of days back. And maybe Dustin can cue that soundbite from uh, President uh, Macron just to listen to what he had to say. And here it comes now. This particular group, which appears to have been involved in this attack, has made several attempts on our own soil in recent months. So, as a precautionary measure, but with credible and solid elements, we decided to increase the vigilance level. Aaron, coming to you after that, I mean, this is the French president talking about increasing vigilance level ahead of the Paris Olympics. And this is also a, a country that faced the Bataclan attacks that was, I think, claimed by Islamic State as well. I mean, is France prepared? to deflect a potential uh, Islamic State attack based on its experiences in the past? 
I mean, obviously, there isn't ever 100% security in anything. I think it's important to understand that. Um, the hope is, is that the security establishment in France is able to stop them. They've obviously, since all those attacks in France that happened in around the 2015 to 2017 time period, um, they've been able to thwart attacks. So the hope is, is, is that they will continue to do so in, in you know, in the next six months or so. Right. I should point out that um, based off of uh, the Islamic State map, there is actually an entry related to the ISKP plot um, that we saw in France. It, it was in November uh, 2022, actually, where seven people were arrested for planning an attack in Strasbourg. Um, and two of those arrested were actually from Tajikistan and Russia. And while at the time it wasn't uh, denoted that it was related to ISKP, mm -hmm. in December 2023, the DGSI actually noted in French press um, that it was linked to ISKP after they did an investigation on it. So uh, that's just helpful context for those that were wondering about that specific one. Adam, thanks very much for that. Please stay on the line because I'd like to go to Colin. Colin, I know that you have to leave us in about four minutes and therefore I'd just like uh, uh, some, some final words from you on this particular aspect when you talk about Europe being in the crosshairs next. Uh, Aaron was talking about France. You also mentioned France. Can we talk about Germany a bit? Because here in Germany, uh, we are all based in Germany. The, the, the interior minister, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, called uh, the Islamist threat one of the greatest threats facing Germany right now. How do you see the threat facing Germany from ISIS-K? Look, I don't want to be uh, a threat inflator or uh, give the impression that the sky is falling. I think it's important to be sober uh, in these assessments. But if you look at the, you know, the international threat landscape writ large, uh, if you look at the number of plots that have, uh, you know, taken place in the past several months, and then you overlay what's going on in Gaza right now, right, which has kind of introduced a new element and one that we really don't know how it will impact individuals that may be planning something extremist. Uh, even, you know, we can, for, for another time, we can get into the divisions between IS and Hamas and how there's uh, a lot of discrepancies there. But to someone, you know, who's radicalized and extremist sitting in Europe, it may not matter that much. It may be a hatred of Israel that pushes them over the edge. Right. It may be, you know, what, images coming out of Gaza, uh, and they may do something in the name of the Islamic State because they're angered by other things. So, you know, Gaza could be a catalyst for other things, uh, but you clearly, again, just have uh, an uptick in plots, and that's a worrisome indicator in and of itself. Uh, and, and Germany hasn't been immune from jihadist terrorism in the past. So, uh, you know, I, I think everybody's on edge right now. And uh, we'll uh, leave it there for the time being with you, Colin. I know you have to go because uh, you have another interview coming up. You've had a very busy past few days, but thanks so much for making the time today to speak to us from your busy schedule. And, you, uh, and and um, and have a, have a good day. I know it's the start of the day where you are. I, I hope uh, it, it is fruitful. Thanks so much for spending your that that time with us. Aaron, please stay with us. And I just wanted yeah. to say that everyone out there, we still have Aaron with us. So if yeah. you have questions yeah. about much. the risks enough. of ISIS-K uh, moving forward, please put them in the chat so we can ask Aaron before we have to let him go. Colin, thanks so much uh, for, for joining us. Uh, uh, coming back to you, Aaron, when it comes to uh, uh, Europe being a target. Actually, before I do that, I just, because Let's just touch upon it because we were talking about it, Amir and uh, Michelle and Jared, before we began this live stream. And it's also the poll question about how worried people are uh, about an ISIS terror attack. How worried are you guys, given that Germany is also in the crosshairs? I mean, yeah, it's something that I think about. You know, when I think about going to a concert, I wonder, mm, maybe I shouldn't go to such a big, huge, crowded place. Um, it does make me think when I'm there, where are the exits? And now I'm going to pay a lot more attention to the security outside. How much is there um, at places I go, say, to a mall or something like that? Um, so, yeah, I would say in, in terms of the poll, I'm slightly worried. Yeah, I think the same. It's hard to watch the news and not be worried about a terrorist attack. And it, it does feel a little bit like um, a nightmare that's returned. <laughs> um, I remember in 2014 when uh, ISIS was the, the top story every day for a while, mm -hmm. and there was just kind of a general sense of anxiety, especially in Western countries, that the 
terrorists could be at your doorstep. And I always thought that was kind of absurd in the U.S. that people said ISIS was going to come to your doorstep. So on the one hand, I am anxious personally when I go into big spaces, as I have been for the past too many years. But at the other, on the other side of things, I do regret that we might be going back into a time when governments use this as a way to um, crack down on political dissent or to make everybody afraid of some threat and to win political elections through this fear-mongering, um, the idea that ISIS is going to show up on your doorstep, personal doorstep in the suburbs of Arizona or something, and then you have uh, somebody come into office who's going to crack down on immigrants, you know? I mean, so I, I don't want to go yeah. back to these times, but I am personally definitely checking uh, my doors locked and things I, like this. I, I want to say, too, like those things that I mentioned, I also have those same thoughts <clears> when <throat> I go back to the U.S. where I'm from because of mass shootings. Mm -hmm. You know, it's violence... Uh, you know, isn't necessarily one extremist right. group over the other. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's not necessarily here in Europe. Other things make me worried when I go other places. Jared? Yeah, I think the, the fears of political point scoring uh, as going forward, as Amin was mentioning, uh, that is definitely something that, um, that that is a concern. I also have to agree with you about concerts, uh, Michelle, because I, yeah, I'm going to a concert in, in June and it just makes you think, I mean, I probably still will go, but it, it just makes you really think... Um, being out in public, in public spaces, going about your daily life. Uh, it feels like it's been a long time since we've had to really be concerned about things like that. And now it feels um, that maybe it could be the start of a return to, to times that we, you know, don't want to go back to. Mm. Let, 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 let's bring in Aaron here. I mean, Aaron, you've been listening to us talk about this and sorry if it seemed like a bit of a tangent, but it just felt important to just... Uh, assess this feeling because we're talking about Europe being in the crosshairs. Uh, I mean, I just wanted to ask you, and feel free not to be able to answer this question or to pass it over, but uh, what, if, you, if, you're, if you're a citizen in Europe, uh, what do you tell people if you have this, this threat of a potential uh, terror attack from ISIS-K uh, uh, looming over your heads? I mean, I, I don't know if this is a question you want to take on, but... I'll just, I'll just I'll, I've asked it anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's a hard question. Um, you know, uh, personally, uh, you know, these attacks uh, are pretty random in terms of when they happen, where they happen, um, and 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 the you know breadth of of these attacks. Um, I'd also say that there's a ton of intelligence sharing going on between different. European countries, as well as the United States, to help prevent these types of attacks in a way that maybe there wasn't back in 2014 to 2017 when we saw a huge spate of attacks in different parts of Western Europe in particular. Um, uh, personally, you know, like uh, like you said about the U.S. context, I mean, personally, I'm, I'm more potentially worried about uh, a, a mass shooting that has nothing to do with any ideology, really just some crazy person, uh, and unfortunately, because you know, the gun laws in the U.S. are quite loose. Mm. Um, uh, but, you know, you, you really got to just, you know, live your life in some ways. I mean, you can't really control what's going to happen. And hopefully nothing does happen. I mean, you know, I, I look at this almost all the time, every single day. So you kind of get numb to it in some ways. It's also um, so it's, it's, it's hard for me to put myself in the perspective of somebody that, you know, this isn't on their radar, you know, almost all day, every day in terms of their work life. Mm. We'll uh, leave it there for the time being. Aaron, thanks so much for joining joining us today and uh, sparing this time. Uh, it's been we've been talking for about nearly an hour now. Thanks so much. I know you're very busy uh, and you have a lot of other interviews to go to and a lot of other research to do. But we really do appreciate it uh, across the table. And I hope uh, all those watching the live stream also appreciated your your wonderful insights. Thanks so much, Aaron, and uh, have a good day. Maybe we'll talk again. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Take Have care. Have a good one. Thanks so much. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering if it's time to uh, get something on the on the poll that we had asked. Ah. The question that yeah, we had asked. Yeah, Jared's in charge of that. So. He's in charge of that. So I don't know. Do you feel Jared. about... I can, sharing results with I us. I can share some Do results. Do we have results? <laughs> Thank you to everyone who voted. Uh, the question we asked you, how worried are you about an ISIS terror attack where you live? And we asked whether you were very worried, slightly worried, not worried at all. Uh, the proportion of you who were very worried is the lowest, 19%. 28% uh, of you were slightly worried and more than half, 53%, are not worried at all. 
Sorry. Great. Somebody Which covered positive, right? Fifty-three percent. Fifty-three percent. Okay, uh-huh. that's good. It'll be interesting. I mean, I don't know if you can see this, but the geography is like from where people are, are saying what they're saying. That'll be interesting, but maybe that's for another time. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Jared. Thank you. So, you know, I'm interested again to go around the table too and find out what people took away from our talk today. So let's start with you, Amian. Um, yeah, it is. Uh, I am very interested in why people <clears throat> are so skeptical in believing that it's ISIS if ISIS claims responsibility. I even saw some people on Twitter claiming that ISIS doesn't exist. And I think in some ways that might, you know, that might be a reaction to this, like every day you hear of a new threat. And so I'm glad that I think today, even the experts said like, look, um, we, we don't want to blow this out of proportion and say that you can't go outside anymore. Um, but it is something to have on your radar that in times of uh, war between Russia and Ukraine and um, in Gaza, um, that, ISIS is still living in a different world and plotting its own um, uh, terrorist attacks and that this hasn't gone away and probably won't for some time. Okay, I guess my main takeaway was when we were talking about who are the people that carry out these attacks or who are involved with ISIS. And I, maybe it was Aaron said that we need to sort of not think of these people as being card-carrying ISIS members, that they are from all different kinds of walks of life and areas and how ISIS has really tapped into these local communities that are spread out in all different places, um, you know, and talking about, the, I guess, the personal and the socioeconomic grievances that, that kind of bring these people towards ISIS, even though they might not necessarily themselves identify as, as members of, of that group. I, I was really struck by the fact that uh, we have... Um, as we were trying to discuss the topic for this live stream and the other uh, news desks that we've done, we've always looked at, you know, this big power competition, you know, this uh, this China versus Taiwan, China versus United States, Russia versus uh, the West and the rest. And we've been looking at this big power competition. And I just wondered if, if these attacks in Moscow remind us that terrorism hasn't gone away. And now that it is firmly back in our radar, I wonder how prepared countries are and given the big power. Specifically, the radar of, of people like us who yeah. consume Western media. Yeah. Because we saw on the map, Mali, it yeah. hasn't gone away from them at all. Exactly. I mean, mm. Hundreds of attacks yeah. and, in and, the past few months. And, and if you move beyond Islamic State and you look at other terror groups that are operating in South Asia, for example, mm. you know, they've always been around. So I'm just, my fear is that in this big power competition that everybody's focused on, and maybe we are guilty of that as well, that we lose track of the terror threat that has not gone away and in fact might be entering a new phase, God forbid, with the way Islamic State has just carried out this attack. Yeah, there's a lot to prepare for. Um, we know that a lot of countries, uh, their defense budgets are already straining mm. um, with <clears throat> the events over the past couple of years. Um, but again, I go back to this idea of competing narratives and what to believe about what happened. And I go back to the fact that, again, this is a common, among the common responses after a big, scary event, um, and it takes time sometimes for all the facts to come out. And so sometimes we just need to be patient uh, before we rush to conclusions uh, and, and follow what solid reporting tells us. And I'm glad that 53% of people still are not having nightmares about uh, terrorist attacks. I mean, assuming that they're not all living, all of our audience is living on some remote Pacific island where <laughs> they don't worry about anything. Or Greenland, because Greenland <laughs> on that map didn't really have much IS or activity. Iceland. Thank God. Thank God for that. Right. Uh, right. I think uh, that about uh, does it for today's uh, live stream of uh, News Desk. I mean, I think we've had a very good conversation with two experts who've been very insightful. We we've, have. And I've we've... certainly learned something. I mean, for sure. For sure. Me too. And we will be back next week. Yeah. We'll be back next Wednesday. And we post the question that we'll be talking about in the discussion 24 hours ahead of time. So. Make sure you sign on and find out what we're talking about. And again, send us your questions. We want to make you a part of the discussion. Thanks for being with us today. Please, and uh, we will see you again next Wednesday. Thanks so much for joining the discussion and the conversation today. Amian, thank you so much. Jared, yes. thank you so much. Thank you. Always a pleasure having uh, a, a live stream with you guys. Thanks so much, and goodbye, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>